presentation up. Okay, now it's not responding. It's great. Here we are. I think let's let's start. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Excuse me, drinking a purple drink. Um, okay, let's um, again I encourage you guys to please um, fill in your questions. If you have any, please use the the chat line, or if you can, unmute and you have a microphone to please uh, speak to me. I enjoy um, chatting to everybody. Uh, sorry, just, let me just grab this. <laughs> Hello? Okay, apologies for that. It was just my gate. You know how it goes. Okay. As I say, please send your, your questions um, via the chat or, or, or have it talk to me. I'm going to go back to um, just show you my screen so that we can look at a couple of things that, as um, I said to you, we'll, we'll speak about after the... Um, uh, in the afternoon session. So let's, let's go through this. Just grab this up. Um, so let's just go back a little bit to where we started. It was Not there. I just want to find this where we had the questions. So just give me a break. Okay. So you guys obviously understood the the uh, difference between a, an installation R value and a system R value. And the fact that the system R values are just um, additive, they just it's just arithmetic that you can um, and, and, and as for arithmetic, if you can take the total that you need and you know what you've got, you know what you've got, you know what you need, what you need minus what you've got will give you the insulation R value. And from that, you can work out the, the thickness required um, from the thermal conductivity value. So let's look at an example that I gave you. So let's just go to slideshow. Okay, oh, there we are. Cool. Okay, so let's just go back one. So as I said to you, if you know what R value you need, you can work out what thickness you need. Because if you look at that triangle, R value is thickness in meters 
divided by thermal conductivity. So therefore, thickness is the thermal conductivity, the K value, times 1,000, just to convert meters, uh, millimeters to meters, times that intervention R value that you need, the, the R value that you're missing out of after adding all the components in your system, whether it be a ceiling uh, roofing component or whether it be a walling component. So if you know what you want, you know that you've got whatever's left over is the intervention R value that you need. So what does this mean? So let's do two, two questions. So the first one is that Lisa told me that the thickness of a foam insulation in a ceiling must be 100 millimeters to comply. Installed insulation is only 80 millimeters. On inquiry, the owner gives you a SABS report stating that the thermal conductivity of the insulation is 0 0.025. Does this comply? Let's deal with this one first. So if you look, let's uh, look at, let's say that the zone is, is zone one, or one to six. So we said, okay, in zone one, we need an intervention R value. So the insulation R value of 3.35. The rest of the ceiling component adds up to the 3.7 that's needed. So they've given us the K value. It came from an SABS report. And it says that the K value is 0 0.025. So we take 0 0.025 times 1,000 to convert uh, meters into millimeters times 3.35. And we get an answer using that of 83.75. So now the question is, it's 80, 80 mils is installed, which is less than 83.75, which does not comply. So people have said to me, you know, does 3.75 millimeters really make a big difference? And again, we would say what, what we tell um, insulation manufacturers is that they should always round up to the nearest sort of five millimeters. So it would be better if they installed 85 millimeters. Because again, if you look, manufacturers manufacture with tolerances. So you can, and it's the same as, as the old sort of weights and measured measures. You can over fill or be a bit over by 1%. Um, uh, and you can be under by 0.5%. I'm being too, or could be 10 and 5. Yeah, I think you can be over by 10 and under than by 5. So if you were to get a manufactured lot that was now slightly below, but still within tolerance and compliance, you then exacerbate the problem. So if the, from that number, if the right thickness of material is 83.75, I would say, then let it be 85 moles as opposed to 80, which is now really below. But again, this is an example is that if anybody gives you thermal conductivity, you can work out what thickness is needed in that area. Let's look at the other thing. So, Tabo receives a deemed to satisfy plan submission. The, R of, uh, the walling R value requirements is 0.5. The competent person claims that a double brick wall complies because the R value of a double brick wall is 0.35 and the R value of the indoor air film is 0.18. So therefore the total R value is 0.53. Is this true or false or is it not? And Remember, I did tell you about that indoor air film that gives you some um, R value. But when we state that the R value of a double brick wall is 0.35, we have already said it's the R value of the system of a double brick wall. So it already includes that um, thin film, the, the, the extra one, uh, 0.18 or the, film, uh, the thin film the air form. So it's it's false because the 0.35 already has got that 0.18 in, and if you add it again, you, you double uh, counting it. And, and that's how in, in 10400XA we say, if you 
we want an R value of 0.35 for a masonry wall. If you build a double brick wall, it will be deemed to satisfy. And we don't say the double brick wall without the air forms outside and inside. It's the system. It's the R value of the system. And this is a, a real example of um, a plan that I came across. Somebody came to me and said, mm -mm, you know, this double brick wall already achieves the, the 0.5 number. Okay. So I hope that's, if you have any questions, you must just yell and, well, don't yell, just ask or put, put it into the thing, into the, the question on, and answer session. Now, I asked you guys about a heritage building. Did any of you have an idea? Let me stop the, the um, slideshow and check with you. Any comments on how to make a... Um, a heritage building energy efficient. Okay, there's just some questions about the edge tool. Any um, idea? Write something. Because now, you know, with heritage buildings, they're very, very strict on like a facade and the look and feel of heritage buildings. But it is possible to make the heritage building energy efficient. So in the absence of any ideas, anybody? Nope. Let's uh, let me go back. Okay. Okay. This is a new town refurbishment, and but what the, the beauty of a lot of these energy efficiency interventions is that they can be hidden behind panels. You can put insulation into ceilings, you can put insulation into a pressed ceiling, you can put insulation into a wooden paneling, and so you still get that whole inside, that, that same look and feel. And it's just that the energy efficiency side of it is behind the panel. And it's the same with the walls. You can put it inside the walls. You can, um, you know, if you get, if you look at uh, types of, of glazing, glazing looks very, very similar, you know, sort of clear glazing and low E glazing. You, it looks the same. So if you, you know, and, and you have to replace the glass of a heritage building every uh, so often because, you know, glass is a, a liquid and as it goes through time and as it ages, it, it sort of goes down and thickens and eventually you have to change the, the glass and you can easily change it with a, with a sort of a higher performing glass without it looking different. You can still put in the same type of frames, the same kind of framing and you can get a higher performance glass. And as I said, the rest you, you can you can look at lighting and use like sort of lampshades and that to give you that same look and feel. And what we do with a lot of the buildings, so um, I always use the example of the Anglo um, Gold Ashanti building at the, um, in Joburg, is it was the oil, old turbine for a mine. And they said they wanted this this turbine to look still have the look and feel of this this turbine, and so they, but they wanted to build the office there. And basically what happened is that we built the office inside the shell of this turbine building, this turbine hall. And so the, you sort of had the outer facade that had the same look and feel. Here we just said, no, you don't have to worry about the look and feel inside, obviously. And we basically built the office inside. Um, there was no lifts. It was only a, a motion sensor escalator. There was um, a motion sensor lighting, daylight sensor lighting. It was insulated, walling and and ceilings, and it was it was all you know. It was very very nice building, very green building, and all due to just sort of using your imagination and changing things and and. and 
putting the right energy efficiency in without disturbing the, the facade of the building. I've done examples at the Windy Brow Theatre in, in, in Hillbrow. We also did a whole refurbishment and we had to keep all the wooden family panelling there and I think there were some press ceilings. We kept the whole look and feel of the total building right, but we made it the, the building energy efficient. So it's really doable. And is this just this example was just really to try and say, stretch your mind and see, you know, where um where you can take this to. Um then I asked you the question on why do we need to add a geyser blanket onto a geyser that already has insulation in the middle? So if you look at a typical water geyser, you've got the cylinder, is normally a polyurethane or some kind of foam insulation, and then it's got the outer casing. But we still say, no, but you must still put another a geyser blanket on it. Now, as you can see by that, that thermal image, um, the, the temperature at the top of, of that geyser is still very high. And obviously that leads to um, heat losses, heat loss into the ambient. So imagine in, in the middle of, of Blum, in the middle of Sutherland, and it's minus something degrees in winter, and that, that geyser is just letting energy go into the atmosphere. So, so as you can see from the picture, that the insulation that's inside the cylinder is not sufficient for it to be energy efficient. So you have to put the insulation on the outside. The thickness of that insulation inside the geyser is determined by a couple of things. One, you just have to drop down the temperature so people don't burn themselves. You know, they don't like, if you just touch it, you, you're going to blister. I mean, if you touch it, it's hot, but you know to, to move away. But it, it's, it's basically, it's limited by the size of the geyser having to fit through a trap door and also by the weight of the, of the, the actual geyser. So if you think of it, if you make that insulation inside the geyser thicker, it means the outer steel casing has to be longer, wider. And then it brings a lot of weight into that geyser. And that's why it's, it's, it's not, op the, the, the insulation inside that um, hot water system is not optimized. It's, it's there for safety, so you don't burn yourself if you're up in the, in the roof void. But, um, and it, it's not too heavy in the, in the ceiling. So it's always, um, and that's why we say, look, it's, it's, it's not optimal. So let's add a geyser blanket. And the geyser blankets are normally very lightweight. So they don't add a lot to the, the weight of the, of the um, uh, hot water cylinder in, the, in your roof space. And then we spoke about um, PV. Now, what has happened with... Um, with the wording of the um, of the requirement of hot water. So it says that you must supply 50% by volume of hot water by non-electric resistive means. Now, if you look at photovoltaic, so so let's look at solar water heating is basically the sun comes down and actually heats up the water almost directly. So in some cases, not quite directly, but it's, it actually heats the water up and that, that hot water then comes to the system. Photovoltaic cells is when the sun hits the, 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 the PV cells and converts that sun energy into electrical energy. So it means that energy that comes from a photovoltaic is electric energy resistance. And so what happens is that it says because you can't use electric resistance heating means you can't use PV. But now, as I said, it was an unintended consequence because we obviously encouraging the use of renewable energy. We don't want, we, we're just trying to get away from grid electricity, not renewable electricity. So it came out as a bit of, a, as I said, a, a, 
an intended consequence. So we're trying to put wording inside the 10400 XA that now allows you know the the a renewable source because we want it to be renewable. And I know some municipalities, because it's so clear that it's non-electric resistance heating, they won't allow um, systems with PV, even if people do thermal cults and things like that. Whereas I have come across other uh, municipalities, other BCOs where they've said, okay, if you can show me that the energy saving um, using the system is still there, we will um, we'll, we'll consider it. So it's a bit of a, a contentious issue at the moment, but hopefully we can get it, get it fixed. Sorry. And I excluded, I mean, I've just answered that question about PV heating and why compliance criteria outlined the proposed 1500. I touched on it and basically what we found is that by not putting some further compliance com criteria into this hot water, these hot water heating systems, is that if it wasn't designed properly, it wasn't achieving the energy efficiency or the energy savings that we imagined it to be. Um, and, and as I said, we the 50% was came about because the sun shines 50% of the day. And when we looked at the systems that were putting being put in, and as I said earlier, if they um the, the storage was not right, or if it was the backup um, geyser would keep on coming on. In real life, those those systems were not saving any energy, and we had to like slowly tighten the the compliance requirements in the version two, because we had to still try and achieve those um, that energy saving. So through. Um, Think what I want to show you. I won't go. What I want to show you is is this this case study. So this because this is is such a good case study because people always say that the biggest drawback of um, compliance with ten four hundred XA is the extra cost to the building, and what they don't take into account is the saving on that building, the saving in um, the cost of, of your your utilities bill. You know, it, it's in in the, pri um, the the level of your utilities bill. So I love this project is that it, it's actually an edge project. So it was it was twenty percent saving. Uh, it, it hit the twenty percent saving on energy, water, and embodied energy. And but it's a social housing um, development. It's it's not a, a, a top, you know, middle to, or higher income uh, residents. So they did the, the EDGE um, certification on it. And if you look on the energy efficiency side, they replaced the conventional geyser with a centralized heat pump and it saved the um, energy in the water. There's obviously efficient lighting I looked at uh, smaller windows to to wall ratio, and obviously they kept the the energy down. But look on the left hand side, is that the, and there were three types. There was a two bedroom, a one bedroom, and a bachelor uh, flat in this in this thing. And look at those numbers. Is that the saving on energy for a bachelor flat was twenty nine percent, for a one bedroom was forty one percent, and for a two bedroom was forty two percent. So what they actually said is some of those flats, the saving on the utility bill was worth more than one month's rent. So basically, by having such a low utility bill, the people that lived in that complex saved a month's rent over the time of a year. Now, fine, we put up there was extra capital cost. Okay, again, as I said, it's an edge rated tool, so it's even higher than 10400 XA. But even at that extra cost, there was payback. And I'm using um, water again, it's, it's there's not such a high payback because water is still cheap. But the thing about water and the, and the argument we have about water is that um, there's a huge cost to not having water. When you load shed, you can generate electricity if you want, but when you water shed, you, 
you can't really generate water. So water is really an issue of what does it cost when you don't have it. But be that as may, let's keep on the, on the energy side. But on the energy side, that upfront capital cost paid itself off within a couple of years. But more importantly, the poor people that were living inside these, these units basically saved a month's rent every year that they lived in this place because it's so efficient. And never mind the knock on healthy, um, the positive health effects that they have, you know, living in a um, sort of a warm, comfortable, uh, um, thermally comfortable environment. It, it was, it's just really such a good project to, to look at and say, you know, this, it, this has worked in a social housing sector, not in a high income sector, social housing. So it's, it's just a spectacular example. These are just some other edge um, certified buildings that's around. I'm not going to go through the edge um, tool now. So, um, the one thing I just did want to say, and then we'll still carry on with questions, is that again, the owner is always responsible because I think um, sometimes I think <laughs> you know, and it's not it's not a bad thing. But when I, you know, my interaction with building control officers, my interaction with plans examiners and with building inspectors is it's not that you guys don't want to help um, the people that are submitting plans and building. I think sometimes you want to help them too much. And, and, and as I said, it's not a bad thing. So I'd never say to you to stop, stop helping people. It's, it's an excellent trait to have. But the buck stops with the owner. So you can help them, you can advise them if you want, but at the end of the day, the buck does stop with the owner. And the owner has to make sure that the building complies. And the owner must demonstrate to you in so that you have no doubt that this building complies. And they might say, look, I've got a competent person energy efficiency, software, whatever, I've got an architect, but still, buck stops with them. And the Consumer Protection Act says, if a standard exists, it will be expected the materials provided satisfies the standard. So um, you will get a copy of the, of the um, presentation. You'll see the uh, um, contact details. But again, don't worry about the part two of these questions. I want to know from you as well is, you know, and we have been chatting a bit, what's your challenges with 10400 XA, but more importantly, what would you like to see in future versions of 10400 XA? And you've indicated a bit more that we probably need a bit more light shed on the rational design of that and the assumptions inside the rational design um, and inside the the sort of the, the software uh, questions that, and the inputs there. It's one of the things we've actually noted. Um, but if there's anything else that you feel that you really would like to see in a new version of XA, you must please let us know. And then the other thing is knowing that 1400 XB is coming up, which is water efficiency. So at the moment, they've done a draft XB regulation. There's a, a SANS 3088, which is water efficiency, it's a voluntary standard, it's written already. And there's a gray water harvesting uh, standard. And again, this is going to come in probably within a couple of years. There'll be water efficiency. And again, I encourage all people, all uh, people within the BCOs, is where possible, become involved where you can. Be proactive because the thing is, at the end of the day, you guys work with these things. And you don't want to be sitting there and then this thing gets thrust on you. Where you can, and, and you can get involved in the SABS committees that are writing these things. And I would really, really encourage that you do get involved in these things because it's important for you to to sort of actually almost guide, guide the way. And and I know the SABS is really looking for cities to be involved. As I say, that's our address. Let me stop. Let me just keep it open, but I'll stop sharing with everybody. Okay, I see there's a question here. Oh, no, just it was on edge. So, 
Now, again, um, we were asked about the numbers that are in the tables for the, the solar exposure for windows. Look, this is the first time, to be honest with you, this is the first time it's been brought to my attention. So I can't really say I haven't looked at the numbers, but know that once the new version of 10400XA comes out, which is, I mean, which will be probably in the next, hopefully next four months, or at least by the end of the year, the new version will come out. And then it won't be a, dis a discussion. But I agree with you, it's, it's not right that there were incorrect numbers in the end. But as I said, this is the first time I've been made aware of it. Um, so I, I can't really say, you know, it, it, it should have been fixed a long time ago if it was. Um, no, and let me say, I, your argument about the exposure factor is is accurate. So I can't say if it's wrong. I have to accept that it is probably wrong. And... It should have been fixed many moons ago. But just please know that it's, it's again, it's no good fixing it now because we are, it's going to take as much time to fix it as the new version is going to come out. And then we don't need those, those numbers anymore. We've uh, put in a whole new system. Okay, guys. So um, I've spoken a lot. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to go through or if there are any more questions that you you have, or suggestions. I, I really, really would like feedback from you in, um, on how, what would you like to see in 10400 XA? And it doesn't have to be something technical. It can be something that the new version is better, um, but is it still is it user friendly enough? I mean, those questions need to to be asked. And and you know we don't want to have another situation where, for instance, the solar exposure numbers are wrong. We, you know, not, and I'm just using that example because again, there's no solar exposure numbers on the new one. But we want to, you guys to look at it and say, yes, this, this is, this is much more user friendly. It's much easier to show compliance. And then with the use of edge, if somebody asks you about capital cost versus payback, if you input the stuff into the edge tool, as Songo demonstrated to you, you can actually see the you know the return on investment and the, and the payback so if anybody ever asks you you can show them that so um yeah so guys the the session is really your session and i'd like to know if you if you have any any questions anything just imagine your either your smiley faces look at me or your like uh, OGM board bases. Okay. Anything? Okay. Maybe while we're waiting for some questions to come through, let's, let's again talk about the importance of the assumptions in the rational design of the reference building, because I think that is where obviously a lot of pain is. And I think, again, when you look at a rational design, and whether it be a rational design, a reference building route, or um, to the numbers in the tables, always look at what assumptions were put into the model. Look at assumptions were put into the reference building, and from there, you can see if you know if it makes sense that does that reference building actually comply with ten four hundred XA, and I think. The more knowledge you get and the more understanding you have of it, the easier it is for you to pick up anomalies. I say anomalies politely, so um, it, you know it can just be an error on, on anybody's side. The other thing is, let me answer some of the questions that have been asked before. People will say to me, "Okay, I have a there's a house and a family. It's a three bedroom house." And the family want to put in, let's take two scenarios. They want to put in, they want to convert the garage to an extra bedroom. Second scenario is they want to convert the garage into a second bedroom and a bathroom en suite. When they submit that plan, do they have to supply hot water um, at the at fifty percent rate, and the answer is not yes or no. 
The answer is, you, if, so now, if they add an extra bedroom onto this house, you have to say, okay, now it's two people per bedroom is our, calc is our assumption. So now instead of three bedrooms, which is six people, we now have four bedrooms, which is eight people. Does the existing water hot water supply still comply with these extra two people being added onto this house? If that geyser is sufficient, because often geysers are oversized, if that geyser is sufficient for that extra two people, you don't, you're not touching the water supply. So you're not amending the amount of water um, that's needed to supply the extra room. And it's the same with the bathroom is again, if it's still covered by, and there's not an, a separate um, source of water. So let's just say, let's not look at a separate geyser. Let's look at if that water, the hot water supply is sufficient for the occupants of that house, then they don't have to submit um, anything about the hot water. But if adding that extra room then makes that hot water supply too little, which means they would have to put other water supply in, which means that if a new water supply comes in, that 50% um, volume rule is in is in um, is enforced. And the other thing is, and it's not to do with energy, but the other thing is that if the geyser is more than 12 meters away from the, the new bathroom, obviously that doesn't comply. And so again, just to reiterate that 10400XA, the energy side of it, doesn't circumvent any other part of the 10400XA, uh, any part of the 10400. The, the rules of the 10400, whether it be plumbing, uh, lighting, fire, handicapped access, walls, ceilings, roofs, they still have to use, the building still has to comply with all those parts and the energy side is, is the add-on. So when suddenly this, this, they've got a bathroom and it's more than 12 meters away, it's, it's not just about energy efficiency, it's now about the, the plumbing rules as well. So you always com combine the two. So again, I know you guys haven't asked, but it's one of the very, very common questions that come up because hot water seems to be quite the, the issue at times about whether you, you um, have to supply any extension with a new water supply or not. And that's really how we, how we break it down. Anything else, guys, if there's any questions? Because, again, I don't want to waste your time, but I, I want you to, to use it. Oh, no, Ian. No, Ian. I... Yes. Oh, you are to, you've gone again. Hi, Lisa. Hi, I can hear you. Lisa, I want to mention to you, uh, Sonko, that tool uh, is a great tool, uh, part of the committee that is basically working with IFA and streamlining the tool in our law. Um, there's a lot that we've highlighted um, with regard to the edge tool in terms of compliance, so uh, it's work in progress. Um, but at the end of the day, it appears to be a tool that will benefit the industry uh, a lot, especially it being an, a World Bank initiative and it being free. So I think it would be a great intervention. However, that would study the fact that it still needs to be, as I said, work in progress and align with the XA. Uh, uh, compliance requirements for Part X of the National Building Regulation. So, um, working with IFA would um, getting the uh, streamline with respect to the compliance requirement of XA. Thank you. No, thank you. That's a very, very good comment. And just so you know, part of this project as well was to. Um, uh, streamline and look at edge 
as a compliance tool for um, you guys, for the, the, the BCO, the, the office. And so I did a report. Um, so for instance, in the edge tool, it talks about uh, like uh, PV panels. Now, obviously inside XA, we don't talk about um, energy uh, source. We don't talk about energy source. So what I've suggested to, to IFC is that when they go through that, they, they'll be like, you know, a like construction or some kind of uh, thing that goes with it and says to, to the plans examiner, if there's PV panels on the plans, don't change it in edge because 10400XA doesn't deal with, with um, energy generation. But other than that, everything that, that has, um, it's got, you know, the fenestration side, it's got the roof, it's got the walls, it's got um, everything, it's got the ceiling, it's everything, it's got lighting. Everything that makes up XA is inside edge. And, and if you, so basically the idea is that you have your building and the plans, and if you take the edge rating tool and you input the stuff on the plans, that if there's no change in the energy use or it's slightly better, then that building actually complies. Um, so it's just a, it's, it's you know, and the more you work with it, the more you play with it, it's it's the, um, the you'll see the benefit that comes out of it. We actually, um, I did a session with um, the Department of Human Settlements of the Western Cape, and we actually put a low-cost building into the edge rating tool. Obviously, it came out really, really badly. Okay, let me just tell you, because edge has got XA, not the norms and standards of the um, of the the Department of Human Settlements. So it did did came um, it came in low, and, and you could just then see how sort of poorly the the these buildings are as far as energy and energy efficiency goes. So a great comment there. But just so you know that, yeah, I've done a, a full report as part of this program. So everything that I've got from the municipalities, all the uh, the BCOs, edge, uh, the plans examiners, and the um, building inspectors, I've taken a lot of all these comments and and as far as and we're relevant, I've put it into the reports for for edge. So it's in there. Okay, I think are there any more questions? Songo, is there anything on your side? Uh, nothing on my side. Yeah, just to okay. encourage everyone to, once again, just to just play around with edge, like Lisa had alluded to earlier. I mean, the only way you, you'll see if it, if, if it has benef benefit for you, for you guys is if you actually play around with it. Um, register on the app, it's free. I would encourage that. Um, yeah, and then if you have any questions there, please do let us know. Mm. Then, Songo, is there going to be a post assessment? We, the, has everyone done the pre assessment? Yeah, hopefully, we've got all the pre assessments in. Can we just get an indication at the chat? Because I believe we have only received about 15. No, we've got 70 people here. I think we had 20 something yesterday. And this morning, I'm, I don't know how many we had. Because normally, what we do is we, um, those who have attended the training before, will know that we do the, the questions prior to the session. And then, um, as a follow up, then do a building plan, plan. Yeah. Uh, assessment. Yeah. So I think what we'll do is, is again, we need the pre-assessments, guys, and um, we've got we've got all the emails. Is that as part of this exercise? I'd really like, and it's it's the, you'll see in the end of the of the um, presentation. We can we'll send you a set of. A um, um, set of plans for for two houses. There's um, a house that at complies with 10400 XA. There's a house that doesn't comply totally with 10400 XA. But each of these houses has some areas of compliance and some areas of non-compliance. 
But and what I'd like you guys to do is just and, and we'll send you a, a, a template because all I and it's just simple. What I'd like to, for you to do is from both plans, not per each plan. So from both plans, I'd like to for you to just note 10 areas of compliance and why and why it complies. So for instance, in the plans, it gives you an R value in the ceiling. Um, and you can say to me, um, plan, you can just call it whatever, plan A, plan B, complies because R value is 3.7, given as 3.7, therefore um, complies. And I just need 10 areas of compliance and 10 areas of non-compliance. But I want to know why. So I can't, you can't say, um, uh, non-compliance because I don't know I can't think of an example now uh, something that you're looking for like uh, underfloor heat there's no underfloor heating or something so therefore no things yeah? so, so it has to be in the building and, and we have to look at what's what's um, what's actually in the building and, and it's just you know, because as I say, you could say things like whether there's, because I know in some of them there's no fenestration calculation. So obviously you can look at that kind of thing and say, yes, it doesn't go apply because of that. Sometimes people say orientation, but again, not orientation is, yeah, you know, that's an example saying this doesn't apply because it's not orientated correctly. Again, orientation is a should, not a shall. So again, if it's not orientated correct, there's no correct orientation because 10400 XA doesn't ask for, it doesn't mandate an, an orientation. So as we really need, and again, as I said to you uh, yesterday, this is not a, a, a question, it's not a measure of, of how much you know, but hopefully in the plans you show that you know way more than you did before. That's my hope because it's a, a reflection on me that I've taught you and, and given you the information that you needed. I think um, if there's people experiencing electronic um, hassles, as I said, our contact details are on the presentation, which we'll send you. Um, and if there are any questions, you, you're more than welcome to, to ask. And I'll put some of your comments into, we'll put it into the report. And I think if if there's nothing else, I'm not going to waste your time by saying, oh, the session's only due to finish at four, because really it's, as I say, I've gone through the content, I've gone through the questions, and I'm just, you know, if there's nothing more from your side, um, we can wrap up. Songa, I don't know if you have any any other comments. Okay. <laughs> I just, uh, I just link, link. link to the building plans. That's what I was doing just now. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'll also share it when I share the the uh, presentation slides and the recordings. So they should also make it effectively easier for you to do the building plans. What we all do is though, what we normally do, we, we ask everyone to do the building plans um, during the session. Um, the last part of the training session, but because of the nature of the, of the beast, which is COVID, um, we'll give everybody, I think, maybe a week. I think that's fair. A week to look at the building plans and then send us their notes. Um, so without the building plans, um, maybe let's do this. We'll do the building plan assessment, and uh, then you'll receive the recordings of the Q&A session, because I think that's yes. a big prize. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you want to do one better, we'll give you guys certificates of attendance for the session because we believe that's important as well. This is a CPD accredited training session. But with that, mm -hmm. yeah, from my side, there's just really nothing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just with the BCOs. Uh, I always learn something new. Think of this issue around the Agrima certification. I think it's something that, as Green BDG, we also want to take on board and see how we can assist the BCOs. And I think Lisa will share some news in terms of her new role, I'm sure, um, with you guys. Yes. Her. 
but I think yeah, um, just from our side is we're 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 an organization that works with all other organizations to drive the green economy agenda and also move all the blockages that are there to like, preventing um, green infrastructure investments in South Africa. So yeah, from my side, um, thank you once again for your attention. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to hand over to Lisa. Okay, and I have an idea. Seeing that we're finishing early, about an hour early, you've got an hour to do your building plans. You know, you could, and it'll take you less than an hour. I promise, it's not, it's not complicated. You guys will pick up ten areas of compliance and ten years areas of non-compliance easily. It'll be like probably less than thirty minutes work. So, as I say, if you've if you've allocated some time, for, and we were only due to finish at four. Please, I encourage you to do it now. We'll, we'll as, as long as we'll send you the the, the um, presentation. And um, so, just also, as you know, Songo alluded to, I am now. Uh, I've left uh, Green BDG. It was Songo my company um, because I'm now uh, the CEO of the Green Building Council. And, but still, I'm in the same sort of field, I'm in the same interest, but we, um, on my side now, we look at green buildings, so green rated buildings, but but still the, the commitment to um, education and training, the commitment to understanding things further is there. We, um, the C40 cities, I know some of you belong uh, from Itaquini, city of Tawani, Joburg, and uh, city of Cape Town, um, it's C40 cities in, and you're moving to a, a net zero a carbon, you want to move to net zero carbon for new builds by 2030. That's also one of the, the, the roles that the, the Green Building Council is doing. So we're still looking and we work closely with, with um, the, the sort of the cities that want to move towards the, the net zero carbon, but also with anybody. So Phil, you know, you have my contact details, please. And I've still got um, the Green BDG email running. If you have any questions, please feel free to to ask and phone. Um, uh, I think also uh, Loyan and myself, we I think we become um, we we got a better and better relationship because when he has questions, he finds me and asks me, and he's more than and, and he hopefully can tell you that I've never said no. I've always always answered the phone, you know, or phoned him back if I couldn't answer at the same time. Um, and we've we've already always tried to sort it out. Same with um, hopefully. Um, with the you know the questions that were asked um, on the you know the particular problem that that Itaquini is experiencing, so guys from that side as well, I also want to thank you very much for your time and attention. I know it's difficult to listen to somebody via um, a, a sort of Teams and and via the the computer because it's it's hard to to keep your attention. So hopefully, I've kept your attention and that you have learned something from the training. Um, as Songa said as well, I'm very appreciative of your time and your attendance. And I've seen, you know, from your questions that that you've been there, you've been present. Um, so on that note, guys, thanks very much. Keep up the good work. Please stay safe. Um, and um, hopefully I'll hear from you soon and we'll see everything soon. So with that, unless you've got anything else to say, I want to say thank you. Don't I think you've unmuted yourself. Yeah. Well, I think on behalf of the quality and my colleagues, we really appreciate the training. And it has been a good session for the past two days. And it's always welcomed. And yes, we do chat, Lisa. I, I still remember last week I've called you. And uh, I, I believe we'll be making much more contact in future, especially where you sit now. Um, and thank mm -hmm. you, Songo, as well. And uh, thank you very much for um, your assistance and advice, Lisa and uh, accommodate calls whenever I do call. Um, greatly appreciate it. So thank you from, from us at Etikweni. And as I mentioned, Songo, if you have any further training sessions that you'd like to oblige to Etikweni, please do not hesitate to contact me. We always welcome these sessions, and you as well, Lisa. And Lisa, you're quite right. correct. Since I've been um, an active participant and represent C44 Etikweni municipality, uh, I'm engaged with the um, program as well, the new building uh, program, and uh, also with uh, Mike Munich on the Edge too. So yeah. both the um, C40 new uh, building program and the Edge tool, 
I am part of that uh, process and I'm guiding that process currently. And the initiative uh, that I've uh, adopted is that it's important that both the processes use the standards or the part X of the national building regulations as the benchmark for compliance. So um, in saying that, thank you very much. And we really uh, uh, thank you for the thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for those words. Thank you. And, and and sorry that I name dropped you, but I just wanted to demonstrate that if people phone me, I would re reply and would return the call. So didn't yeah. So I'm just using your name in vain. So, no. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, guys. So from my side, as I said, without further ado, I want to say goodbye. Thanks again, and yeah, hopefully see you you soon, either virtually or in real life. We'll see how things go. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Keep safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. Bye.